Hello everyone, legendary Alex Cardinelli here. I hope you guys are having a great day so far. You know, 2021 was an incredible year for me. 2021 was one of my better years in recent memory. I had a great 2021. It was fantastic. I really don't have any complaints. Because in 2021, I had a great job. I love working at Texas Roadhouse. I was making money. I got all the dream fish that I wanted. And I'm here on YouTube kicking ass. So I think it's fair to say 2021 was great to me. I can only hope that 2022 will continue to be a great trend for me and another great year. So when 2021 started, I was still doing audio podcast and I was getting quickly burned out because I have been doing podcast since 2013. So uh, I was running out of ideas and I was getting tired of audio podcast. So my buddy, uh, Matt Thibodeau from Springfield, Massachusetts, and I were talking about what I could do next because Matt is a loyal uh, viewer, a loyal subscriber, and a great friend of mine, and he loves my content. And Matt suggested that I bring my stuff over to YouTube, and I thought that was a brilliant idea because I love watching videos on YouTube, and I love creating content. So this year, you guys got to bear witness to my podcast style on video. And I think it was the greatest decision that I've ever made. Because I have a lot more fun now with my uh, podcast by doing it video style. And you get to see my personality. And I get to have a lot of fun. I've got a lot of wonderful subscribers that I truly value and appreciate. So I'd like to say thank you to Matt and everybody that has supported me this year. I look forward to 2022 where I'll be celebrating my eight year anniversary in March. And I'm sure that we're going to have a lot of other exciting videos coming out in 2022. Our holiday bashes this year were very successful. The Thanksgiving and Christmas bash had some awesome viewership numbers. So I thank you guys for tuning into those holiday bashes and everything you guys did in 2021. So since there's only like a day and a half left of 2021, today... I am going to celebrate the best of 2021 with all of you, my legendary subscribers. I am going to show you some of my best clips from my best videos of 2021. These may be funny videos, these may be informal videos, these may include some of my funny story times, stories that I shared with you, and there will be some fish videos as well. So basically something for everybody. So I hope you enjoy the best of 2021 legendary Alex Cardinelli style. And if you are a new subscriber, this video is going to show you all the content that you can look forward to in 2022. So make sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you are a new viewer. I could definitely appreciate that. So with that being said, enjoy the rest of 2021 and enjoy this long compilation video of all my best videos of 2021. Happy New Year and I will see you Friday night, December 31st, 10.30 p.m. Eastern, 7.30 p.m. Pacific for the 2021 New Year's or the 2022 New Year's Eve bash. Let's party in style. Bang, 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 bang. Enjoy the video, guys.
And I ended up seeing a gentleman, a really big gentleman. He had to be about 400 plus pounds. And he was doing something very unorthodox in the men's clothing aisle. Now, normally when you are buying clothes, don't you think about trying them on in the fitting room or trying them on somewhere, maybe the bathroom where people can't see you. Not This wasn't the case with this big, big guy. I mean, if I was that big, I wouldn't want people seeing me trying on clothes right in the middle of public. But anyways, what he was doing was stripping down to his boxers, trying on pants and shorts. And one of the shorts he put on was so tight, it almost burst and broke in half, split in half. And my brothers and I started laughing in the next aisle. And the story of my life, just my luck, he happened to hear us laughing. And he stared at me for quite a long time. It felt like it was two or three minutes he was staring me down. So after he kept staring me down, I said to him, can I help you? He asked me, he said, do you work here? And then I said, no, I don't work here. And then I said, as a smart remark, something that I shouldn't have said, but it's funny to this day, I said, why is your fat ass staring me down? <laughs> that statement kind of made him really upset. After I said that, there were other people in the men's clothing aisle, and they were all laughing. They were laughing very loudly, so he got furious and really upset, and, I, and now at the age of 27, I can understand why. You have to understand, I was 18 at this time, so it's like hitting, uh, finishing teenage years, becoming an adult, so I, I was kind of immature at the time. But anyways, after I asked him why his fat ass was staring me down, he got really mad. He then threatened to kick my ass or slap my face. I can't remember what it was. I think it was, I was going to slap, I think he said I was going to slap you across my face. And then I said to him, bring it on, fat guy. <laughs> And then he just he started walking towards me, and then I said, you can't even run fat, so I'll outrun you. And uh, at that time, I stayed ready for a fight because I knew I was going to have to defend myself, even though he was 400 plus pounds. But luckily, it did not result in any fights, thank God, because I don't want to go to jail for putting my hands on a 400-pound gorilla or um, him hurting me, possibly. He probably would have ate me if he had the chance because <laughs> he was really huge. Anyway, people overheard the commotion and uh, a group of tall, tall, muscular guys came by, and as well as my parents. And he towered down instantly and said, it's cool, man. And he gave me a handshake at the end of it. So <laughs> I just thought it was really funny. Um, I still laugh every time I tell the story to other people. You know, it's very odd seeing somebody change in the middle of an aisle. It, it is not something that you should do? What if there was young kids around or a woman around? They don't want to see you in your boxers, especially if you're 400 plus pounds. That would scare kids and give women nightmares with that big belly hanging out. <laughs> so those people 
who like to ridicule you saying your fish are in dirty water or your fish are in too small of a tank or whatever, I call those people fish police. And I'm just going to say that's a PG-13 term for what I really want to say. Fish police really get on my nerves. Do not become a fish police officer. Instead, offer constructive criticism or talk nicely. Talking nicely and offering constructive criticism is beneficial for every tropical fish keeper. Now, what happened today and last week to me was not beneficial or constructive criticism. When I am at work, I don't want my phone going off with notifications from people on Facebook. I have a very busy job. I don't have time to be uh, checking on uh, Facebook all the time, but my phone kept vibrating, and I had to check to see what was going on because I thought it was family. Anyway, what I saw was very shocking. It was a whole slew of comments about one of my particular fish pictures, and I had to delete them all because some of them were not PG-13 and not what I would want on my personal Facebook page. Basically, uh, a few people said I was an awful fish keeper, I shouldn't be keeping fish, and stuff like that. That is what bothers me in the aquarium hobby. People don't have a right to tell people what they can keep or how they should be keeping it. I'll just say this, if you're not paying my bills, if you're not buying my fish or buying my fish supplies, you do not have the right to tell me what to do. That's just how it is. That's how I look at things. So I appreciate your opinion, but my, my standing on that is everybody has an asshole. So that means everybody has an opinion as well. And I'm not saying your opinion is wrong or incorrect or any of that. I just don't have time to deal with negative comments like that. I see that all the time on Facebook groups. I see people putting down um, other fish keepers and it just bothers me. I can't stand bullying in the aquarium hobby. This is supposed to be an aquarium hobby. It's a hobby after all. So let's keep it that way. Keep the negative stuff out of the aquarium hobby and make it fun. So that's, that's just what I wanted to talk about because someone asked. Hi, Alex. It's Christine Kish. I just wanted to take a break from editing my cookbook to stop and wish you a very happy birthday from sunny California. I hope you're enjoying your new life in Florida, and I really enjoy following all of your adventures. So take care, my friend, and hopefully after uh, Corona passes, we'll be able to see each other one day. Take care. Love you. Bye. He's actually been following us since we started uh, Aquatic Wetline. Oh, cool. And he wants me to ask you what your fondest memory is of the podcast that we hosted and who was your favorite guest? Um, the fondest memory is the headache of going through. I have something that I go through. Um, what's Eddie Murphy, brother? Uh, Charlie Murphy. The thing when he was doing um, one of the uh, things with Chappelle where he did this little shake thing. I always had stage fright. For some reason, I had a fear of public speaking that I'm going to mess up. I'm going to do this. So my fondest memory is just over preparing myself for each episode. And as soon as we finish the episode, I'm like, that's it. We done. It's supposed to be more. So I think that was one <laughs> of the fondest memories of just the preparation of um, getting things going. And I guess the guest, I can't remember his name, but he was... Um, he had some type of um what was it um i'm trying to think of the name where he had where he were he was going to save fish and he had him he, he was keeping them in pools and stuff and he came oh over. the monster fish rescue place yeah him and um what's your your buddy name 
Oh, uh, the he old guy. To, he moved to the Philippines. Oh, William T. <laughs> William T. Having them two, having William T. and Alice just go back and forth on a podcast on you're not telling what you're supposed to say. And I wish we could have did a behind the scenes of all the stuff we had to go through. I and know. I that's what made him and then, you know, him being an elder and being into fish keeping, but really didn't understand what he wanted to do, how he wanted to do it. And he felt the world was against him. Illuminati in the fish game. But that was fun. I, I, I will say that it, it was fun. It was a, a great experience to, to do to do that podcast. <laughs> A lot of people say they love my voice, and I'm like, I hate my voice. I can't stand my voice. I, I'm just getting comfortable with video, and I guess for my job, we're doing so many Zoom meetings. I just got comfortable over the last year of just seeing my face. I hear you on that. I'm kind of new to video myself, but I got used to it. So how did you get into the aquarium hobby? Well, I was reading up, and my son was younger, and he has Asperger's, so I was reading up on things that helped kids with Asperger's, and I read up about how, you know, fish help with kids with Asperger's, so I went and got him some fish to try and, you know, help him out and stuff, and I think it helped me a little more than it did him. I kind of got hooked, and, you know, first off, we started off with some goldfish, and I kept them alive for a while, and then I decided that I'd do a bigger tank, but I didn't know a whole lot, you know. So I bought a tank, added some water, and threw some fish in, and then all those fish that we kept alive for a year, you know, I restarted their nitrogen cycle, and then I killed those, so then I was trying to start again, and we tried to figure out what I did wrong, and, you know, kind of the, just got into it, and now I'm doing pretty good with it, so. It's been one of those trips, you know, you start out and you learn as you go. I think we've all had that before we've had those rough spells and your new learning experiences and stuff like that. My son does love to fish. Like, we have 110 in the dining room with a bunch of um, angel fish, and that's everybody's favorite. They're kind of like big puppies or little puppies, I guess, depending on what size dogs you got. <laughs> <laughs> I like angel fish. They're an awesome fish. Yes, and we have nine of them, so they hang out and chill out, and they kind of all go in sequence and stuff. It's a lot of fun. They play around in the plants, so. Nice. I like the wild-caught um, angelfish. They're pretty cool, too. Yeah, they are beautiful fish. I can honestly say that. I haven't gotten any wild-caught angels yet. I've had some other fish that are wild-caught, but haven't got haven't broke the bank on the angels yet. You'll get there eventually, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I probably will be in a lot of different places eventually. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's neat. Like I said, everybody, all most of the stuff that we get, I always I try to make sure that I have a setup for them that they can live the rest of their life there. You know, they're there for pets, so you know we'll let these run their course and see how we do. That's good. You're a great fish keeper. Yeah, I try to be. I enjoy it. You know, it's kind of one of those things is you do your best and learn as you go, make friends, and find out what you're doing wrong as you go. <laughs> That's very well said. So currently, what do you have for fish right now? Oh, God. Um, what do I have? I have, like I said, the angels. I have some catfish, upside-down cats. I try to keep most of my stuff under six inches. I do have a few different types of Africans. I have a bunch of different live bearers, including an Amica Splendens and um, the Dodriae X Do Dodriae. Um, those are really fun. They're real colorful fish that are on the cares list. Um, we have all kinds of different tetras. I have some endlers. We have some goldfish. We have, God, <laughs> so many things. Of flagfish, I have a couple killifish, I have a couple um, shell dwellers, so just kind of got a little tank of everything here and there. Nice, you got more than I have. I only have one tank at the moment. Yeah, I have quite a few <laughs> tanks, and I got more in the shed, but no room to put them up yet. Someday. <laughs> That's cool. So you're getting more involved in the aquarium hobby. 
Yeah, I'm pretty involved. Like, um, I work at a school where they have kids with mental and developmental issues, and um, so I'm looking to set up a smaller tank for my office and then be able where the kids, if they're behaving or whatever, they can come in and check out the fish or if they need to help check, relax or something. So I'm trying to figure out like a smaller tank that I can set up in my room. I don't know if I'm going to do a small tank with some pea puffers or just do shrimp or, or maybe do some of the dodre or whatnot. But, you know, something fun for the kids to be excited about. And then it also, you know, we're setting up a breeding program with the college where, you know, we'll bring in some breeding pairs and the fish, the kids can learn about breeding the fish and writing down and charting the stuff on how they, you know, what happens and, so they'll be able to get their cares points and hopefully get more young people into the hobby. We're having a dying hobby where it's a lot of older people that have 70, 80 tanks, but we don't have a whole lot of young people who are really stepping in for more than think they're going to get rich because they see the cost of a, what an African or some of the plecos be. And then they breed the heck out of them and can't get rid of them all. And then they get out of the hobby. So, you know, hopefully we'll be able to bring some young people and teach them a little bit about why we do the conservation and what we do and the different programs and how neat it is to share fish with your friends, just not to get rich off of, but just to meet new people, learn new things and have something, you know, in common or, you know, sometimes the fish don't like the way you do it, but you can take it to your friend's house after you've been working for years with them and they just put them in the water and next thing you know, they got tons of babies that you never could, you know what I mean? So it's definitely a fun challenge. It's one of those things that, you know, I really enjoy the hobby. I really enjoy talking to the people. I've met so many amazing people from all over the country and the world in the fish hobby. So, I mean, for somebody who's not really a big social outgoing person, I get to meet all these friends and talk to them online and learn about the fish or dream fish that I know that I won't ever have a setup for, but you know, learn about them and see them and see them in their more similar habitat or how they take care of them, how they breed them, stuff like that. Like, I enjoy, like, the big cat catfish, but there's I'll never have a setup or I won't have a setup for a long time that I can put in an aquarium that's 600 gallons or more for some of these big catfish. But, you know, I can see how other people do it and see their ponds and talk to them about it. So you almost get to live vicariously through your friends in the fish keeping hobby. That's very true. Uh, I agree 100% with you on that. And I think um, more younger people should be getting into the aquarium hobby. They'll learn a lot and they'll teach them a lot of responsibility and it's something positive in this world. Oh, definitely. And I mean, there is so much to do. I mean, there there's a lot of health benefits for keeping fish. Like I have the tanks that I take care of and I donate fish to, like I set up different tanks at the nursing home. And those ladies love those fish. Those are their pets. They sing to them. They talk to them. And heaven forbid it, when it passes away, they're ready to beat me up over them. So, I mean, they, you know, that's part of their family. They, with COVID, they weren't allowed to see their family, but they had those fish to really come to and see it was part of their family. And then I write out a little book with all the different fish that they have, their different names and types and where they come from and stuff like that. So they have something to help enhance with their mind and keep their mind sharp as they study the fish and learn about the fish so i mean it gives them and then whenever somebody a new nurse or somebody comes in they always have to tell them about the fish and the different stuff info that they found in the book so i mean not only is it something for them to enjoy but it's also something for them to use to keep their minds sharp and have something new to talk about to somebody different that you know over the weather you know how bad the cardinals or good the cardinals are depending on where we're at and you know so it actually brings a whole new definition or whole new quality of life to people that are shut-ins or not able to we've helped a guy get um uh pet you know using as a what do you call those pets like that they have like service dogs as a service pets we had a guy with a mental illness be able to get a, his african cichlids into his apartment because they helped with his mental illness so he could sit and watch those and be calmer or help him with his outbreaks and stuff so we've helped with the club. We've helped him get that set up and use those as a service animals because in his apartment, he was only able to have like a 10 gallon tank, but he had this beautiful African tank that he's worked so hard on. And that was his thing, you know, because he, he would go through real bad depressions and 
anxieties and stuff and the fish help calming down so we help them get that as a service you know there's so many benefits to the actual just keeping of the fish and learning about the fish and you know your nature when you don't have nature some i mean i'm lucky enough to live out in the country where i can come out here at work and get ready to mow and we have another baby deer we have two middle-sized deer mama deer we have foxes and you know, so I get to spend time in nature all the time, and I really love it. But most people live in busy cities or crowded cities where they don't have as much of an opportunity to go out and see nature or learn about it. So the, then you can keep a tiny little nature in your house, which, you know, requires maintenance. But it's not like having a dog where you have to take it out, find a place, you know. So it's a way for them to enjoy life, enjoy nature, and have it in a, you know, little glass box. Hi, I'm Jeremy Storhorn. This is my submission of where you were when 9-11 happened. At the time, I was cleaning the office or the break room office in the school I worked at, and I saw the plane go into the second tower. The first tower was already smoke, and I kind of walked in and was going to see what was going on, you know, just clean the room up and stuff, and I saw that, and then we didn't have the teachers with their phones and stuff, so then they were kind of were spreading around to the different teachers and stuff. There was a lot of fear. There were a lot of parents that were coming to get their kids, not knowing what was going to happen. I work, or, you know, we live by a place called Scott Air Force Base in Belleville, Illinois, which isn't terribly far away. So there was a lot of concern about a plane trying to come down into, or terrorists coming down into the Air Force Base, or even people were scared that they would actually come into the college. I remember I'm a pretty big guy, and some of the ladies were so upset, and that was what they were telling everybody is, well, don't worry, Jeremy will take care of you. And, you know, I mean, you try to put on a brave face, but you're like, yeah, one, I don't think the terrorists are coming, but if they do, I'm one person against them all. But that was my story, is it was kind of, you know, I don't, I didn't really kind of believe it, or, you know, at first I saw it, and I thought it was a big accident, and then after all the fear and stuff, it was just one of those days that you're ready to be home, and kind of be dumb, you know, home with your family, instead of kind of out in the craziness, it was a really wild day on 9-11. All right, thanks, Alex, bye. What's up, y'all, it's your boy, B. Tank, Hey. Coming at you for Alex Cardinal. 9-11. Where was I? I was working at Lawrence Marshall Chevrolet in Hempstead, Texas, small town. Oh, early morning, I was at the coffee caddy in the sales showroom making me a cup of coffee. Over to my left, was the TV in the lobby, and I noticed there were salesmen gathered around this TV and the couches. So as I'm looking over my shoulder, you know, I'm looking over at the screen, I see the planes going to the towers. I'm thinking to myself, movie trailer. But they're just, uh, they're fixed on the screen, they're mesmerized, so I asked somebody, hey man, well, you know, <laughs> New movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, what's going on? Sylvester Stallone, it was like, no. The terrorists, you know, they, they, they just crashed some planes into the to the towers, New York City. What? I mean, I guess it still didn't soak in at the time. So, I went on, finished making my coffee, went back over to my department, make ready. And I noticed that my manager, I mean, he was just in a trance at his computer in the back of the office at the desk. So I asked him what was going on. He told me what was going on. And I mean, it was still so crazy to me. You know, we're, we're Americans. You know, we can't be touched. You know, that's the mentality. And for someone to show us that we can be touched and that we should pay more attention to our borders, pay more attention to our politics, pay more attention to how we treat people or allow ourselves to be treated. How it affected me. I'm not a person that overreacts to anything. And if nothing is going on directly in front of me where it's gonna to touch me or my family, 
physically or immediately, I don't overreact. I took it for exactly what it was. I mean, that wasn't anything that I could change in the way that I was living my own life personally. But it just let me know being fat, complacent, as Americans, we just need to do better because there's other people looking at that, being envious, uh, having a desire to have the things that we're afforded. We should realize how much that we are blessed and to not take other people for granted in those situations. No, the factions that did this were evil, yes. But we take all these scenarios for granted to the extent to where we leave ourselves open to attack. God bless USA. Shout out to all those first responders that was on the spot that gave their lives to save the people that they could save. God bless the families for those that weren't saved and those who haven't even been found even to today. Y'all be good. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your families. I am Big Tank Hank on YouTube. I'm a fish too, but I own fish, uh, aquarium fish. Uh, buy, sell, trade, you know, to the public as well as the fish family. I have a live stream where I bring people in, new YouTubers, uh, established big YouTubers. Um, I bring them all in, you know, to give them a safe place to be introduced to everyone else in the hobby so they can seem more um, approachable, you know. And for those new people, give them a platform, you know, to show their wares or to show their desire and their passion for the fish hobby. Go check me out, Big Tank Hank, live stream, 1030, Friday nights, Central Time. Y'all be blessed on this 9-11. And remember, those that couldn't be here to see this today. Peace. So this is real simple. You can do this a number of ways. You can typically take a knife and chop your rolls in half or in quarters, or you could just do what I do and break them apart with your hands. Um... This is really easy, and um, hopefully my camera looks good. This is my first time doing a baking video solo in a long time. So hopefully uh, it's good quality and you can see what I'm doing. All right, so this is the last one going in. All right, now we're going to take this over to the microwave, and I'm going to melt the butter real quick. So I put the butter on for about 30 seconds. And I'm going to check it in a few seconds because I don't want to over melt our butter. There's sugar in there. Okay, that looks good enough. It doesn't have to be fully melted. Like at this point, that's okay. If you get it to like that point, that's fine. It doesn't have to be fully melted. So now what you're going to do is you're going to pour that in with your bread. And you're going to mix it before we make our custard. That way, this doesn't um, like cook our eggs when we make our custard. So I'm going to take a spatula. And I'm just going to make sure this is all combined. And it's all covered in the butter. And the butter has uh, honey and cinnamon sugar. So you know this is going to be a really good uh, dessert. So this is going to be a little bit sweeter than your ordinary bread pudding. Um, although some bread puddings can be on the sweet side. But I'm not using any raisins or any fruit because we really don't need it for this recipe. Because the cinnamon, the honey cinnamon bread, I mean the honey cinnamon butter and the Texas Roadhouse bread is the star of this recipe so once you have everything combined like that 
which should be good. I'm just going to make sure that it's all combined. Um, and for those of you who are asking me how many dinner rolls I use, um, probably like 16 to 18. I bought two dozen, but some of them were eaten. Um, but 16 to 18, you're going to get a good amount. All right. So now we're going to put this aside. It's all covered by the honey cinnamon butter. And now we're going to make our custard. Now, an optional step which you can take, which I'm going to show you what you can do. If you want like more of a cinnamon flavor, you can sprinkle some cinnamon sugar on top of that cinnamon butter. And it'll, it'll become like a monkey bread. So that's that. Now we're going to move on to our custard, which is really simple. I'm going to take four large eggs. Or you could do five, but I think four is enough. So here's our first egg. And there's one of our egg yolks. All right. So now that I got the eggs in there, I've got the four eggs and then the two egg yolks. I'm going to add some sugar, the vanilla, and the milk. And then I'll give that a good whisk. Now I'll show you a secret ingredient that I like to add. So now we'll add all this milk. And I'm going to add a little bit of vanilla extract. And now, to sweeten it up, we're going to add about a cup of sugar. So I'm pretty good at eyeballing. So I'm just going to add some sugar, probably like three handfuls. That's good. Now my hands are all sugary. That's okay. And I'm adding a little bit of my secret ingredient. So this is my secret ingredient, Cold Stone Creamery Sweet Cream, which is going to give it like a ice cream flavor. A little bit of that. All right, so now I'm going to take a whisk, and I'm just going to whisk all that together. So we want to make sure you get all the egg yolks combined. Mix this really well. So this might take a few minutes to make sure it's really mixed well together. Because you want to make sure that you don't have scrambled egg pudding when you put this in the oven.
Yeah. All right. So this should be pretty good. All right. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All right. So this is what you should end up uh, with, your, with your custard mixture should end up looking like. Well, I'm going to mix it a little bit more just to make sure it's you get as much air in there as we can. All right, that's good. So I'll put this aside. Now what I'm going to do is we're going to take our custard mixer mixture and we're going to put it in with our bread and we're going to make sure that each piece of the bread gets soaked. So we're going to slowly put that in here. There we go. So now it might look like there's too much liquid in there. What we're going to do is we're going to take our friend, our spatula, and we're going to mix it all together because this is what's going to create that nice moist pudding. Now, the best thing about using Texas Roadhouse dinner rolls is that they're actually best at the restaurant when you, when you uh, first get them brought to your table because they're fresh out of the oven. And when you bring them home in a to-go box or uh, a bag that they put them in, they start losing that fresh flavor and they start getting hard, which is perfect for a bread pudding because that's what you want. You want a bread that's going to be hard so that it can absorb all that delicious custard that we just put in there. So we're going to let this absorb for about five or ten minutes and then we'll put it into a pan and bake it for about 45 minutes at a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven. So I'm just going to continue to mix this well and then we'll pop it into my prepared pan. So that looks good. All the pieces are coated. Now I'm just going to let it sit for a few minutes. All right, that looks good now. So I'm going to let that sit for a few minutes and then we'll put it into the pan and put it into the oven. We'll be right back, folks. All right. Now I've had, I've had the mixture sitting for a few minutes. As you can see, it's all become one mixture. If I can show you. So now we're going to put that into a pan and pop it in the oven. So let me just show you how I do that. Now the pan I'm using is already pre-greased with non-stick cooking spray. So it'll be easier to come out. So now we're just going to take our bread pudding. Push this back a little bit so I can show you how to do it. All right. So now we're just going to put that there. Uh, it's not showing you for some reason. There we go. There we go. As you can see, it's going to make a lot of bread pudding. It's going to make a lot of cake this year for Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to spread this out. So it's going to, so it's going to look like a, almost like a cake. Because that's because of the custard. And now we're just going to push it down. 
All right, and we are now ready for the oven. So this is what it's going to look like before we put it in the oven. As you can see, a big full pan. So this is going to this is going to take about 45 to 55 minutes in the oven. And when we come back, we'll let it cool. I'll show you how to make our vanilla sauce, and I'll show you how to serve this legendary dessert, folks. Stay legendary, my friends. So this is about 45 minutes in the oven. As you can see, it looks nice and golden brown. So now we're going to... Attention! Hot! Stand at attention, you piece of human waste! We're going to start this party with the Pledge of Allegiance. Stand up out of those chairs and repeat after me loud and clear and that's an order. Maggots, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I can't hear you, maggots. Now let the party begin. USA, USA. <laughs> and look at the writing under it. I am a maggot. President Joe Biden. A pedophile. And he's also a scum, a slime, and a maggot. <laughs> it's kind of funny, uh, some of the things that you could create taking an actual picture of Joe Biden and turning it into a, a PNG image. <laughs> and I made a poster. And the poster was what I would post everywhere in the men's room for, for the prank. So on the poster, I took a picture of the dean of students. He had his face picture on the website. So I copied and pasted it on a, a poster. And I, and I put in funny text because I was going to place it in the men's room. So the text that I put in was, pee on me, I like D-I-C-K. <laughs> and I hung that up in the men's room. So there was like four, four men's room, four bathrooms in, in my school. So each one had a, post, had a picture of this guy with those words that I I posted. So I posted, I put them next to every urinal, one in the main men's room and then one in the handicapped men's room. And I forgot where the other two were. But after I did that, I went to class with him on a normal day. And my friend came up to me and said, I, he and said, you had the audacity to do that. I thought you were going to do something else. Originally, I was supposed to do something similar to that, but it wasn't going to be to that extent. He, he thought I was going to get in serious trouble, and he thought I was going to get suspended and all that stuff. But it didn't happen, luckily for me, because there's no cameras in the bathroom. It's illegal to have cameras in the bathroom, so that's how I was able to pull this prank off. Anyway, my friend took a picture of it, and... And uh, that was the last I heard of that. Somehow, he ended up finding out about the prank. And my brother found out about it through, through uh, the dean of students during lunch. My brother was having lunch with his friends, and he overheard the dean of students talking to one of the principals about his face being plastered in the men's room with inappropriate language. And he was trying to figure out who did it. And if he caught that person who did it, they were going to be in trouble. Well, luckily for me, I did this prank like two or three days before I could officially leave school and wouldn't have to go anymore. So he never found out about who did this prank. So when I was done and I left and school was over, 
I finally graduated. And my friend goes, he still doesn't know who did it. Should I tell him? And I said, you can tell him if you want to because I'm graduated now. It's not going to hurt me anyway. So I don't know if he told him or not, but he probably doesn't even know that I did it. So I told a lot of people after I graduated that I did that. And they were like, and they were really surprised because they thought I was a nice person. But if she really upset me, I could be an asshole sometimes. So that is my senior prank. That is what I pulled off. Everyone else's senior prank that I know of wasn't to that extent. Um, this one will be memorable for me because I thought it was kind of funny, and I thought it, I thought it was unorthodox and kind of wrong too. I shouldn't have done that, but he really got under my skin. All right. So now we're going to add in the white chocolate. Give it a nice little stir. This is the white chocolate and milk mixer. We'll add that in there. Get this out. And don't worry, when this cools, the white chocolate will will settle. So we'll put this back in on and mix it. smells good with that white chocolate addition. All right, turn it off, and now we'll give one more, more spray down and add our candy canes. Alright, so now we're going to let the KitchenAid do the work as it will crush up our candy canes. So we'll add them in now. You're going to hear some crunching. And it's going to make it turn like a nice pink color. Maybe I'll put the final four in there. The last two I'll decorate on top. All right, perfect, it looks beautiful. So now we're gonna add our last ingredient, which is the Cool Whip, which is gonna help thicken it. Because I added a little bit too much milk, mine looks a little like cheesecake batter, but that's fine. It'll sit up in the fridge. 
Yours, if you add a little less milk than I did to the white chocolate, it'll look a lot better. But it's, it's going to go in the fridge and it's going to sit there for three or four hours anyway. It's going to firm up. So now we're going to take 16 ounces of Cool Whip. And again, if you're making a little, a little less portion, you'll use 8 ounces and you'll use an 8-inch pie crust. That's what the Cool Whip looks like. So now we're going to take the Cool Whip and plop it in. I'll push your grandma and uh, my mother when I younger. So, um... If you don't want to use Cool Whip, you can use homemade whipped cream, but Cool Whip is fine for this recipe. You just get the rest of it out. Perfect. We're good to go there. Almost done. So now we're going to mix that in. Basically, this is a, a white chocolate peppermint cream pie. It's better than that one you'll find in the frozen section of your grocery store, I can assure you that. I mix it well to make sure all the ingredients are combined. Perfect. One final scrape down and we're ready to put it in our pie crust. It looks a lot better now. It is done. So we'll take off the paddle attachment. And you can see how the it looks a pink color. That's from the candy canes. Alrighty. So now we're going to divide that in our pie crust. I have two pie crusts just in case. So we'll see how much this one will end up making. But like a chef is supposed to do, you're supposed to try everything. So I'm going to give this a try first to see if the taste is there. And then if it's good, we'll get ready to put it in the pie crust. That is delicious. Perfect. Not too sweet either. All right, so now we're going to take our prepared pie crust and we're going to put that pie in the pie crust but I'm going to show you what it looks like. All right so now we got our pie crust here and now we're going to fill it with our mixture here. So I'll take out my spatula and I'll put some in. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to need another pie crust. We'll see how this looks. I think that milk was a great addition to this recipe. It, it looks so good. And it's going to firm up once it sets in the fridge.
to spread this out. Yeah, I'm gonna need to use the other, definitely need to use the other pie crust. So here's pie number one. I'll show you in a second. All right, so now let's get our second pie crust. So you're gonna get two pies out of this recipe, which is good, you can give one to friends. Put that there. All right, now we're gonna put the rest of it in there. This one might be a little bit shorter, but you can still get slices out of it. So, so you've got enough for about a 10 inch pie and an 8, eight to 9 inch pie. This one's going to be a couple inches shorter than the other one. So you get a lot out of this recipe, which is good. So if you have large families for Christmas, then this is good for you. Alright, so now we're going to spread that out. And then we're basically done with this recipe. Because now all we got to do at this point is let these set in the fridge. For you could do three, four, five hours. The longer, the better. The more this sets, the more flavor it's going to get in the fridge, and, in the, and it's going to set up and, and uh, firm up in the fridge. So it'll be much easier to cut, and, and it's going to firm up, and the flavor's got to mingle. So now we're going to decorate the top of the 10-inch one. We'll wrap this one up. Put this back on my computer for now. So. What I'm going to do here, I'm going to use my scissors. Break the candy cane in half. Put it in there. There. Just so people know there's peppermints in there. One there. Doesn't have to look that pretty. I'm not a bakery, so. Do we got any more? Oh, we got a couple more candy canes. So I can decorate this. Do you know Christmas is still being celebrated? Yeah, it, do it does. Yeah, so I mean, like, I mean, get all the Christmas you can. That's what I'm saying. True. It was almost Valentine's Day when we took the treat out last year. Every day he would ask me, is today the day we're going to take the treat out? I was like, no. <laughs> no, it makes me happy. Leave the tree up, please. Valentine's is a kind of a sad day for me. Oh, man. I don't have no one to share it with. <laughs> oh, man. Except I don't for like my, that. Except for my brandy, my beagle. Oh, what a big, what a, nah, that's not the same thing, though. I know. <laughs> not yet. So do you have an un-Valentine's Day day? Every day. <laughs> so do you do it extra on Valentine's Day? Do you, you, you really like, I, I hate Valentine's Day? No. I mean, I like the, um, the candy and, and the red velvet waffles that I make. Okay. Maybe you need to like, okay, when you go out for New Year's, don't drink the four drinks. Drink two drinks. And when you meet someone, tell them about the red velvet waffles that you make for Valentine's Day. And I'm going to tell you what's really going to get them. Say the last person I dated, I made these waffles for them and they loved it. But they left me because people love to know what you did for someone else in hopes that you would do it for them too. But in this story, you're really gonna, you know, make the waffles for them. So that's what you do. I'll make sure to mention that. Yeah, and then for Valentine's Day, you have a Valentine. I'm telling you, I think that'll get them. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you get them over by their stomach. <laughs> yes, yes. Women like to eat. True. And spend money.
Hey. <laughs> Eat. Stay focused on eating. Don't worry about the shh. <laughs> All right. Let me see. What else can I ask Alex before we get out of here? Ask him about the aquarium. Ask him about future plans. He's going to get a car. Hmm. Did someone say waffles? Yes, we did. <laughs> yes, we did. We said waffles. Hard shaped waffles. Do you ship those waffles, Chef Alex? I probably could. I bet you could. We could ship anything. You can ship it through Amazon, too. I bet you. Make them right now, and I can have them by breakfast in the morning. By the time I get up, somebody will knock at the door, and my waffles will be being delivered by somebody from Amazon. Yep, I think that could, yeah. Uber Amazon, I think that's it. All right, y'all y'all think I'm playing. Watch Uber and Amazon get together. It won't be because <laughs> I said so, but it'll be because I said so. <laughs> <laughs> You want to hear something funny about waffles? Yes. I went to a, like a breakfast restaurant, and uh, they had what was called the blue velvet waffle, and I didn't know what, I didn't know what it was. So I researched on uh, on Google, and I Google got disgusted by what, what I I got disgusted by what I found. What but, is a blue? Uh, ruin it for the rest of us. Ruin it for the rest of us. What is a blue velvet waffle? Uh, it was it was disgusting. It was like a, a dirty vagina or something like that. No. Yeah, it was. No. This was years ago. Um, we don't want that. But there, but the restaurant. I I asked the. I told the server what I found, and he he was shocked. But theirs is just uh, chocolate and blue food coloring and cream cheese. Oh. Well, no, we want we don't want blue food color on our cake with cream cheese. We don't. No, thank you. So they named it after something, and they didn't realize what they named it after. Yeah, blue waffle. Oh. Hey, I <laughs> found out about a that is disgusting. That is disgusting. Babe, and she says, "How many times have you changed your name, Alex? Great idea, and you have me hooked." She's right. She's on to something. I have changed my name here on YouTube many times. Let's see, Aquatic Wetline, um, Aqua Alex Aquariums, Alex's Aquariums, Exotic Fish. Uh, let's see, the real Alex Cardinelli, the legendary Alex Cardinelli. I'm sure I'm missing a lot, but it's always good to change up your YouTube channel, change up your content. But I'm not going to change anymore. I'm liking the way my YouTube channel is right now. And I haven't seen Psychedelic Babe in a while. Hopefully she's doing good. And maybe she'll tune into this 500th video. On to the next comment now. So this is from someone named Father and Son Man Gats. And this idiot says, can I have my kids with you? So I'm assuming that this person is trying to be funny, but no, you cannot have your kids with me. One, because I have a dick and balls. And two, because you're a male and you have dick and balls as well. And a male and a male can't have kids. There's no way I can get pregnant or no way you can get pregnant. And there's no way a baby can come out of either one of us. So that stupid question gets a stupid answer. I don't know why people like to make jokes like that. So that is really, really dumb. So now I'm going to put on my Sergeant Slaughter persona. And I have a message for father and son man gets. A turd hula. Drop it, give me 10, you maggot. <laughs> That's funny. All right. So my next comment that I'm going to react to comes from Roll Tide. Alex, do you make money from your videos? 
Unfortunately, I haven't made a dime from any of my videos. I have made money from my podcast, but not my YouTube videos. So hopefully in the future, I will make money from my YouTube videos. All right. So my next comment comes from Stinky Potato. Wow, what a name. Cut some weight, dude. It will be good for you. No hate, mate. First of all, I will not take health tips from someone named Stinky Potato. And I understand where you're coming from, but I am per perfectly healthy, and I have lost a lot of weight already. So I don't understand why people worry about other people's appearances when they're doing videos on YouTube I don't say those kind of things to people, and I don't expect people to say that kind of stuff to me. Hey, you maggot. <laughs> in, the last, in the last comment I'm going to react to, Matt Guide Dice. Nice video, but it appears you ate the chocolate chicklet. Just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. What the fuck is a chicklet? It's chocolate cichlid, you moron. I hate when people mispronounce cichlid and pleco and all the fish species. I don't know what a chocolate chicklid is, but I know that there's a chocolate cichlid out there. All righty. So those are all. <laughs> yes, this is Santa. You'd like to talk about Alex? He did what? <laughs> oh, he's here. Oh, hello, Alex. What a nice surprise. Your BFF called me. <laughs> After talking to her, I think it's important that we look at your file. Your BFF wants to make sure that you made it onto my nice list this year because you are a great cook. Before making a decision, I need some more information from my elf Sonoma. Let's see what he says about you. Hmm, it seems you worked really hard this year. Alex? My elves and I think you deserve to be on my nice list. <laughs> I better get back to work. My elves and I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Oh, oh. And keep up the good work. That was an amazing video. And that is just one of our videos that are going to be from PortableNorthPole.com. And remember, you can still customize a Santa Claus video for your loved one considering 